Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Sean Devine. I'm the rental coordinator for Global Test Supply. Uh, today's topic is going to be the fundamentals of portable gas detection with BW Honeywell. And we, we kindly ask that you mute your microphone during the webinar. Our presentation will last between 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for a Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions at any time. Simply use the chat feature and we'll get to your questions at the end of the Q&A period. So Global Test Supply and BW have been working closely together for many years now. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of BW in the US. This is a result of our dedication to offering you the product expertise, service, and competitive pricing. So let's get started. Today's webinar, hosted by Global Test Supply University, is presented by Andrew Saunders, the Applications and Training Specialist for Honeywell Analytics. Andrew has been in gas detection for 40 years, and he's conducted hundreds of technical workshops interna internationally. So we are grateful to have Andrew with us today to show us all of his expertise. Andrew, if you could please take it away. Thank you, Sean, and welcome everyone to today's webinar on the fundamentals of portable gas detection. Today's agenda, we're gonna be covering the regulatory landscape here in the US, some reminders about confined space and use of portable gas detectors, the two main functions uh, of a gas detector, wearing, where to wear, I should say, a portable gas detector, startup, auto zero, uh, applications uh, where you use the monitors. Uh, so a lot of times we'll talk about the what, which is the monitor, but where it's used is important, who uses them, uh, and why they use them. Um, the alarm thresholds programmed into the gas monitor, remote sampling techniques prior to entry into confined space, what to do during alarm situations, and list of potential contaminants for the sensors, calibration versus bump test, what the difference is, use of an automated station such as uh, uh, the IntelliDox or or microdoc docking station versus a manual test uh, using the IntelliDox, maintenance, cleaning, service, uh, use in extreme weather conditions, what to do, and then we'll have our Q&A at the end. So here in the States, the regulatory landscape simply is OSHA, it's the force of law. OSHA 29 CFR 1910.146 uh, established back in 1993 for permit required confined spaces has been the guidelines of everything else that's transpired since then. Uh, ANSI Z117 standard, uh, NFPA's uh, 350 um, uh, best practices for safe entry and work in confined spaces. Uh, across the board, we've really used this as uh, a guideline for you know, taking it into any other direction that we wanted to go. It's still the gold standard for confined spaces. And recently uh, they came up, well, I should say uh, 2015, uh, they updated the standard for the construction industry, but really looking at it, they uh, um, upgraded the periodic testing, atmospheric testing to continuous atmospheric testing. We'll talk a little bit about that in the upcoming slides, but that was uh, uh, an upgrade in the requirement based on the technological advances of gas monitoring since 95, 1993 standard came out and then this 2015 update for specifically the construction industry. The other agencies that we look uh, to are NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. OSHA, just so you know, is a division of the uh, um, uh, Department of Labor. And uh, NIOSH is a division of the CDC, which has got quite a lot of uh, notoriety during COVID. And that's also a, a division of the Health and Human Services. Uh, ACGIH, American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, um, comes out with their recommendations for threshold limit values of many toxic gases that are out there and often raises the bar as far as what you know, our gas monitors could and should do in terms of protecting workers out in the field. Uh, but bottom line is it really comes down to OSHA. Having said that, there was a recent uh, uh, issue we did an article on, I think uh, back in 015 or 016, where um, 
there was a company that exposed their worker to styrene um, and he got ill, went to the hospital and they were cited for it under the general duty clause. And they fought it in court and lost because uh, OSHA came back and they were arguing that the, uh, the level that he was exposed to was below the permissible exposure limit or PEL that OSHA has listed for styrene. And OSHA came back and said, look, there are, you know, our, our PELs are decades old, but there's enough information out there from these other agencies that if you did your due diligence, you would have protected your workers. And bottom line is they had to pay the fine. ANSI, uh, American National Standards Institute, they have a confined space safety um, document called the Z117 confined space standards. Uh, ISCA, International Safety Equipment Association, and NFPA, uh, we are uh, members of these two um, agencies and we work with them to develop such things uh, along with our competition, MSA, Industrial Scientific, Drager, 3M, and we develop uh, uh, best practices and protocols that even OSHA has adopted for bump testing and validation of direct reading portable gas monitors in the field. And of course, CSA Canadian Standards Association. Uh, so OSHA's 1910.146 requirement talks about employers must identify confined space hazard or areas, inform employees by posting signs or feasible, and prevent entry by unauthor unauthorized, untrained personnel. Basic definition of a confined space is it's large enough for a worker to enter, not designed for continuous occupancy, and has limited means of uh, entry and exit. A permit required confined space has all of that, plus one or more of the following, a hazardous atmosphere, known or potential, material uh, with potential for engulfment, inwardly sloping walls or dangerously sloping floors, or it contains any, any other safe, uh, serious safety hazard. So from an atmospheric standpoint, you know, do we have enough ventilation? Is there enough air uh, in there to sustain uh, people, it's not going to be dangerous, or you know, do we have to introduce external sources of ventilation? Typically, it's only one way in and one way out. And here you can see a couple of uh, what we, you know, most common confined space that people think of is there on the top right. You know, you pop the manhole open and do your entry, climbing down into uh, whether it be a, a sewage line or you know, in many cases, uh, telecommunications and uh, and, and uh, vaults, underground utility vaults. So you got process vessels and boilers and sewers and tunnels, pipelines, storm drains, all of that. Um, we talk about if you do a pretest and you determine that it's safe to enter, well, what can happen? Uh, why do you have to continuously monitor? Well, sometimes the work you're doing can actually change that atmosphere. If it'd be like welding or painting degreasing, scraping, sandblasting, mucking, inerting. Uh, a decade or so ago in Colorado, a PEM stock in Colorado, um, workers were doing the painting of the inside and they were going into, you know, a few hundred yards into this like tunnel, if you will, and they were painting the walls and they brought in MEK, methyl ethyl ketone, uh, to clean the lines and to prepare the walls so the, the the paint would stick, that MEK ultimately exploded and killed five workers. Uh, actually, the sad part about it was they were on the side of the fire. Five workers were on the one side, they were able to exit the other five that were uh, still inside the PEM stock on the other side of that explosion and fire um, that was maintained by the 55 gallon drums of MEK they had there. Um, they just had to wait for somebody to come in and uh, put it out so they could get out. Unfortunately, they did not have a good rescue plan or any plan. They called 911, but firefighters uh, really weren't prepared for, you know, getting a fire truck into a confined space. So you got to have a plan. We'll talk about that. You can also do things like inerting where you uh, uh, purge all of the oxygen out of a confined space for purposes of making sure there's no fires or explosions, but obviously dangerous for any worker to get into. And therefore, sometimes it's just a remote monitoring process. Monitor and ventilate continuously is the rule. It should be the strong recommendation, if not the rule. 
depends really in here in the states you know you've got to at least conform to fed osha but in some cases uh you know states can raise the bar by lowering the threshold of where the alarm goes off and any accidents will result in changes in the confined space atmosphere that occur after entry is initiated like i mentioned in that previous story if monitoring determines that the air is safe ventilation keeps it that way interestingly enough you got to make sure when you're ventilating is that in fact fresh air uh wasn't it was back in the early 90s when we sold 1.6 million dollars of multi-gas monitors like you see right there on the right uh, the equivalent of the bw max xt2 to at&t back when they were pulling all the copper wire and putting in fiber optics across the united states they called us up and they said that our monitors are not working properly they've been doing this for decades and all of a sudden they have a problem the only thing that's changed is our monitor must be wrong so they called us up and they said they you know want their money back i was able to determine when we went up there that they were using antiquated equipment to do the ventilation to run the engines that pump the fresh air in which was a small Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engine where the intake was six inches away from the exhaust and was creating carbon monoxide, let alone once we established that that can't be done. Um, they said, well, we're in downtown Manhattan, Drew, with all that traffic. What are we really, you know, pumping down into this confined space where we thought it was fresh air? And then it occurred to me, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what did you have before this? Because I know you were using gas monitors. Well, it came... Come to find out, you know, because I would have thought, you know, it's a 90% replacement market, you know, why didn't you have this problem before? The monitor was doing its job. And they said, well, back then, they prior to our monitor, it was only a two gas combustible LEL meter and oxygen. So from that standpoint, they thought everything was fine. Come to find out after we did all of our changes with the ventilators and we were able to raise that immediate alarm, and have the time-weighted average come into play, which is concentration over time, it was uh, feasible for them to do their work. And, uh, and, and now that they had an awareness of that CO that was in there, but they had to continuously monitor. There was no pre-testing everything's fine and go in there. They had to continuously monitor for that carbon monoxide. And quite honestly, at the end of the day, they pulled me off the side and said, Hey, Drew, you know, I had some workers that were complaining of headaches after the day or even at lunchtime. Uh, one thought he had the flu. If it was on a Friday, that he thought they were just trying to you know, get out of work early because they all came back the next day and looked fine. He said, we were getting them sick, weren't we? And I said, that's a strong likelihood that was the case. So, you know, it's awareness. And then uh, all of a sudden they had to take action, which they did. And I'm very proud of what they did. They didn't hesitate, they replaced all of their uh, jet, um, equipment for ventilation to cleaner burning generators. Uh, a lot of it comes up to, uh, sorry, it, it's not me. So just wanna talk about monitoring, uh, determines that the air is safe, ventilation keeps it that way, providing it's fresh air. Uh, the only way to pick up changes before they become life-threatening is to monitor continuously. And prior to any entry, it's essential to determine confined space atmosphere is safe and also continuing continuous monitoring ensures that workers remain safe and these two devices have internal pumps in them so they're good for the attendant above uh, or outside the confined space and then typically a, a worker that enters can have a diffusion instrument although he can take one of these devices in it doesn't matter if it has a pump or not it's just more economical to equip people with the attendant having a pumped unit and the entrance having simple diffusion monitors. Now, where would you wear these monitors? Uh, we came up with a tech note that said, you know, Honeywell Analytics portable safety gas monitor designed to be worn in harsh outdoor and indoor industrial environments. These environments can include hazardous gases that present toxic, combustible, or abnormal oxygen levels. When determining where to wear a gas detector, it's important to consider the following. The density of the gas hazard, is it heavier than air like H2S, lighter than air like methane, or equivalent to ambient air like carbon monoxide? The caveat with the carbon monoxide being equal to air is that it typically comes out of an internal combustion engine. So it will rise, then as it cools, it will fall and equalize 
uh, with the ambient air. Uh, there are devices that can interfere with gas detector functions, such as two-way radio. We've come a long way to mitigating that effect, but you don't want to key the mic with the antenna right on the monitor. But nowadays we have uh, um, good RFI EMI protection, as well as the coating of the devices uh, with a, a, um, a very protective environmental coating that also helps protect against the e RFI and EMI pulses it may see. It's the, uh, is the user easily able to recognize the alarm conditions, audible, visual, or vibration? You know, we have workers out in oil fields that wear them down on their boot because their primary threat is hydrogen sulfide. It's much heavier than air and they will pick it up early uh, down low. However, you still have to consider, can I hear it? Can I see it flash? Well, I know that it's an alarm. Uh, because it was down there on their boot, sometimes they actually felt the vibration similar to others that were on their hard hat. And they would clip it to their hard hat and they said, you know, I can feel the vibration. I certainly can hear it. It's much closer to my ear, but they couldn't see it flashing. Another worker might. So the job of a portable safety gas monitor is to alarm the user to potentially life-threatening atmospheric gas hazards. Use common sense and consider the source of the hazard. And where the device is close to the breathing zone is practical, and where an alarm condition will be obvious. The detector should be experiencing the same atmospheric conditions as the worker. So prior to opening the hatch and ventilation, it may be a static environment where the gas stratifies with the gases lighter than air hanging out at the top, heavier than air hanging down at the bottom. Um, and pre-testing should be able to identify that. But once work is being done and it becomes a more stirred environment than static, the gas is usually homogenized much better. So just a few inches of a, you know, uh, or a foot difference in where you wear it, it's not gonna be a, a, a major concern. Um, and sometimes if you put it directly in the breathing zone, it will detect as we take in a, a, a deep breath, we're inhaling 20.9% oxygen. That's what the monitor is set to detect for fresh air. When we exhale, it can be anywhere from 19 to 18%, you know, so you might download the, the monitor if it was right up inside your breathing zone and see a sawtooth curve of it going up and down with the frequency of you inhaling and exhaling. So a lot of things to consider um, and, and, uh, and, and it is just that, you know, you're gonna be wearing it based on your application here. Uh, if it was a general rule, I'd say close to the breathing zone is practical. Uh, this is uh, understanding the hazards in terms of gases having different properties and molecular weights and being heavier there, lighter than air, even equal to. Uh, in this particular side on the, uh, on the right, you know, one of the things that is done, I think, you know, when talking uh, in a symposium that the uh, Industrial Hygiene Association put on, we had a PhD uh, there from OSHA and I kind of said, you know, like one in five people that own gas monitors fail to use them properly, if at all. And she was just shaking her head and I'm like, okay, Janet, where am I wrong? She goes, half, half Drew, don't use them properly. And that's why training is so very important. We're more than happy to put on these webinars. Um, you know, so what we want to do is make sure that you do a proper pretest. And OSHA recommends every four feet um, in direction of travel. Well, if you've got a 10 foot drop, you know, typically that's just inside, middle, and then just uh, below, just above the very bottom. So we're kind of doing the top, middle, and bottom. Uh, you want to take into account the delay in the hose getting uh, um, all of the gas to the sensors. The longer the hose, the longer lead time you're going to have to get it before it even starts to uh, react on the sensors. And then we talk about T90, the time it takes for the sensors to reach 90% of full response. General rule on a four gas monitor, O2, LEL, COH, 2S, is about 30 seconds for T90. So that means, and if the hose is two seconds per foot, and I got a 10 foot hose, that's 30 plus 20. So almost a minute, 50 seconds for top, 50 seconds for middle, 50 seconds for bottom. I once had somebody call me up and, and I've seen them do it improperly before. They throw the hose in there, count to 10, pull it out, and think that's a proper pretest. Somebody called me up and said, Drew, is it possible this monitor is alarming to the asphalt on the ground? Because we do our pre-test, pre then we put it down on the ground and we begin to enter the confined space. 
they were doing just that, creating a pocket of gas in the hose, putting it down there, then the sensor started to respond. And in their perception, it wasn't coming from the confined space. It was coming from the ground, which it wasn't the case. So just want to emphasize that a proper pretest would be at least a T90. And if you get anything other than nominal, 20.9000 on a standard four gas, then you want to wait the full two minutes for a 100% response of all those sensors, because in a permit required scenario, you're going to have to document those values and then take any action to mitigate or uh, to move on. These, these are the gas hazards that we're talking about, oxygen deficiency and enrichment, flammable gases, toxic gases. And in, in terms of oxygen deficiency, I think we can all relate to, we need oxygen to live. Oxygen enrichment is a big deal when we talk to the NFPA of preventing fires and explosions. Um, back during Apollo 1, you would think NASA knew it all, but uh, we lost astronauts uh, Gus Grissom, White, and Chaffee on the launch pad when they were going through a practice session before the launch the next day in Apollo 1. And they were in an environment which was 100% oxygen pressurized. And a small spark under Gus Grissom's seat turned into a blazing inferno that killed all three of them within about 30 seconds. They just recently, over the last year or two, released the audio. It's horrific uh, of that. Uh, and then ever since then, and I guess we were lucky in the Gemini and, and uh, Mercury programs because it was the same environment. But since then, including the International Space Station orbiting us today, there's a 60-40 mix, which meant they had to carry nitrogen, which had no other purpose other than to dilute a, an oxygen-rich environment. It's still oxygen-enriched, but it's much different than what it was. So these are some of the things that you have to be concerned about. And obviously, uh, the oxygen deficiency, that's the number one cause of deaths in confined spaces still today. Emergency response time. 60% of workers killed in confined space accidents or would-be rescuers. Down here in Florida, I work a lot with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Team and uh, their little brothers down in Monroe County in the Florida Keys. Uh, not a lot of population down there, but they uh, had the residents complaining of a very rotten egg smelling odor coming uh, from the street. And they sent a crew out um, and um, just a work crew out. And the first worker went in, identified the smell, went in to see what the issue was. It was a block line that was accumulating all of this, and uh, he didn't come out. The second worker went in after him, he didn't come out, and even a third that never came out. They called 911. The fire crew from Monroe County came out, and the young fella couldn't get into that confined space with his, his tank on, his SCBA tank on, so he took it off to try and get in there because his main focus was to save these people. He went in a cardiac arrest, fortunately for him, he made a full recovery, but that's just the point is that most of the people work uh, that are killed are the would-be rescuers. So really, you know, wait until uh, help arrives, even though you're the intent attendant, your natural instinct is to go, go help someone. I mean, we just had a sad uh, case where, you know, somebody drowned while trying to save two other people here right off of, uh, uh, off the beach with the, with the heavy current. So, Sometimes the best thing to do is, is have a plan. Well, it is the best thing to do, uh, but to not certainly not go in yourself. And then if you have a good plan, and trust me, calling 911 is not really a good plan. So if you're in this environment, they have to have a detailed plan on how they're going to respond. And the first thing would be self-rescue. Honeywell makes self-retracting lifelines. Uh, if you wear a harness, the other one would be non-entry rescue, uh, where you don't have to go in, but you can pull them out like you see here with this tripod pod and uh, and probably the harness that the worker you can see on the left is wearing the worker would be inside wearing and lastly would be entry rescue which is what that firefighter tried to do and almost lost his life so this is what you want to do you want to pretest prior to entry and these monitors here all have internal pumps except for the one down on the right and that one you can even use a hand aspirated system to sample that uh, uh, that remote location even before you pop the hatch for gases that are lighter than air and possibly could be explosive like natural gas, which is methane, mostly methane. 
uh, some of the common gas hazards that we're talking about. Um, we made them bold in this case, as far as the, the primary four, what we call standard four gas monitor, oxygen, combustible gases uh, in the LEL range that we test for, carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. Um, carbon monoxide, sometimes they conflate the two, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide, uh, we actually exhale carbon dioxide and there's 400 parts per million in fresh air, let alone inside a building where it builds up as the population increases inside the room. Um, but 400 is not a problem. If it was carbon monoxide, 400 would be a big problem. Hydrogen sulfide, and then you can see the other gases that can go be the fifth gas in a five gas monitor or six gas monitor, like you see with the multi ray pro or uh, BW Ultra on the right, uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, um, and depending on the application, we'll show a chart, uh, next slide, that will show you the threats per industry. So hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide are what we call the toxic twins for firefighters and first responders. Uh, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, diesel exhaust is going to have uh, what we call NOx, N-O-X, for both of those gases. It's a combination of ozone, phosphine in the grain industry. There's uh, phosphines being used for fumigation. Sulfur dioxide, pulp and paper mills, a lot of SO2, and volatile organic compounds. That's what a PID uh, will detect uh, VOCs, um, and uh, that's kind of a broad range methyl ethyl dethyl detector, and it won't really tell you what species of alder and any compound you have, but we'll give you early warning. And more and more, we're seeing uh, wastewater treatment workers using a five gas monitor, even if it's just what's in the attendant's hand. Uh, so they never know what somebody's gonna flush down into where they're working. This is the slide I was telling you about, which are common threats by industry, agriculture, aircraft maintenance. I, uh, I had the pleasure of working with the team that fixes Air Force One up on Joint Base Andrews, and uh, they had, you know, LELCO, O2, and a PID for jet fuel, and it was specifically for wing tank entry. Um, we've done a lot with United Airlines and Southwest Airlines and um, you know, so, and even the FAA has uh, had a lot of our gas alert micro fives and micro -dock, docking stations for specific wing tank entry. I can break down each one of them, uh, you know, been on uh, at pulp and paper mills, a lot of H2S, just in the fresh, not even in a confined space, just open air. You can smell the H2S or you can smell the sulfur dioxide burning your lungs. It's amazing what these workers have to put up with. And uh, now we're really focused on, you know, giving them a very safe, healthy workplace and detecting for this and making sure that we mitigate it as much as possible, if not wearing respirators. So this is to give you a good idea. The biggest takeaway from the slide here is that you've got all of these industries heavily loaded on the on this left-hand side, which was, you know, com combustible LEL O2 COH2S and then sparsely populated in the middle. And those are your opportunities for single gas applications or that fifth gas in that five gas uh, monitor. So standard four plus one of these. Um, and then all the way over to the right, it gets heavily populated again. And that's the most common five gas monitor would be the standard four plus PID for a broad range volatile organic compound sensor detector. This sometimes people say, well, what is fresh air? And I, this was something I found that I thought was the best illustration of, of what fresh air is comprised of. And uh, it really comes down to 99% of is oxygen and, and nitrogen, right? In fact, sometimes people even say, I, I need a nitrogen meter. And, uh, and really what they're concerned about is, you know, displacement of oxygen, if there's too much nitrogen coming from an external source. Uh, others, argon, that's almost the, the remaining 1% there is argon. That's an inert gas. It's not toxic. It's not combustible. Uh, other gases such as carbon dioxide, you do want to pay attention to. Um, and then 
and, and any other unnatural case where any of these other gases would rise. But we can zero out the monitor. And in many cases with the BW product, they're set up to auto zero upon startup. So you must always turn them on in a fresh air environment. If you can't, then many, many cases you can disable that auto zero feature and uh, just ensure that when you do your calibration, of course, you're gonna have to do it in a fresh air environment and it will zero out the toxics and the explosive and calibrate the oxygen to 20.9. And this is just in case I put you to sleep, it's kind of a, a wake up to see in this particular case, good example of methane, natural gas accumulating because it's lighter than air, right below the surface of that 45 pound manhole. And if you look at the internet, and you even, uh, if you see that name come up uh, in China, uh, Jintang, uh, Kina, China, You'll see, that, you'll see where that manhole landed. It landed on an apartment building that was like three or four stories high. Uh, that's how high it went. Uh, he broke his collarbone, not sure if the left or the right when it hit him or he hit the ground. And all he was really expecting was he was expecting an explosion. He just didn't expect it to be that violent. And he was just gonna be like, you know, setting off a firecracker and, and uh, it was a lot more than that. And these are the things, if he had a gas monitor, he could have determined that it was just way too powerful not to do that. I don't know. We don't really actually detect beyond LEO. Would have gone into overrange and he probably would have done it anyway. Uh, to wretch to burn, to lean to burn, that's what we're talking about. LEL is the limit, like uh, for methane, 5% in air is the lower explosive limit for methane. And uh, you know it will be flammable, combustible all the way until it gets to 15%. At that point in time, it'll be too rich to burn. There's not enough oxygen to support that uh, uh, combustion. So you know we will take that white portion of the slide, and that's the measurement range of our portable safety gas monitors, zero to 100% LEL. Actually, we'll have that alarm set at just 10% of that range to give you an early warning uh, that you have a potentially explosive environment and to get you out of there safely. So we do set these alarms very conservatively. As a matter of fact, if you were doing hot work like welding, uh, the recommendation is to set it to 5% uh, LEL for the alarm. It's gas exposure alarms, so you have immediate alarms for both low and high oxygen immediate alarms or instantaneous alarms for low and high combustible gases in the LEL range. And then you have toxic gases has four different alarms, high and low immediates, and an eight hour average called time weighted average and a short term exposure limit, 15 minute average. You can have one TWA alarm and uh, up to four STEL alarms and then you're done for the day. For example, working with that AT&T uh, uh, application, we went out to a manhole and we noticed that every time the traffic backed up, the monitor went into a CO alarm of about 60 parts per million CO, green light down to two or three, and it went in and out of alarm. That's why they called us and they said, look, your monitors are not working properly. Come to find out they never tested for CO before. And that was what we, but they were now worried about how do we do our work, Drew? I said, well, we set these up default setting to mark alarm immediately to what OSHA allows you to breathe for an eight hour day. But if that's not for you, in many cases, applications like steel mills, they have to raise that immediate alarm. You can't raise the time weighted average. So concentration over time, if you double the concentration for what we allow uh, of 35 ppm CO for an eight hour day, uh, and you can breathe 35 for an eight hour day, well, if you double it to 70, how long can you breathe? and that would be half the time or four hours. And what the monitor would do was after those four hours at an average of 70, it would go into a time-weighted average alarm and that's it, you're done for the day, go home and breathe fresh air. Go to a safe environment, and breathe fresh air. So you can't be in any kind of suspect environment after that. Um, and like I said, for Stell, you might have a truck that pulls up and you know exposes you for an extended period of time and uh, you get a Stell alarm, clear it, wait for the atmosphere to clear, go through your proper protocols to re, uh, uh, 
occupy that confined space. But if you get four of those, then you're done for the day. That's what OSHA has said. Um, what to do during alarm situations, evacuate. Advise supervisors immediately, make appropriate corrections and ventilate. And then re-evaluate the atmosphere as though you're uh, uh, coming there for the very first time and do it all over before returning to that work area or right inside that confined space. When you look at the markets of where we sell gas detection, and we looked at it in 2014 and then 2019, if we had a, a pie chart for 2020, you would see the oil and gas uh, market shrink because they started shutting down oil rigs and we weren't flying, we weren't driving, we were in lockdown. Very, you know, so a gas price hadn't you know, been that cheap in a very, very long time. What we were able to do though is, uh, you know, take our resources and focus on other markets. And we really grew wastewater and utility market and to compensate, not fully, but made a big difference in focusing and educating, you know, our, our channel partners as well as end users of the hazards in these other vertical markets. And we were able to, to pivot and, and, and we've learned a lot even in doing so. So one of the byproducts of this interesting world that we live in nowadays is it kind of forced us uh, to focus in other areas and opportunities. And those are the two big ones. Uh, and this is um, uh, our BW family of products right here. We've got uh, the Max XT2 and Quattro BW Ultra. That's our five gas. In fact, you know, there's a motto we are using now is, is five gas the new four gas with that PID sensor and that broad range of all the organic compound monitor. In a lot of cases, it, it's, you know, people are upgrading to that because technology has made it much simpler to use and a lot more affordable. Uh, gas alert Micro 5, its predecessor is still around, BW Clip 4. That's a monitor that you don't have to charge, a four gas monitor that you don't have to charge for two years. And then you know, it's done and you go ahead and recycle it. But that's a two year continuously running four gas monitor. And what we found is that some of the people that were uh, buying our single gas, I mean, the BW Clip and BW Clip Real Time, very economical monitor to buy and when, especially when you have to um, uh, outfit you know equip thousands of workers i've seen thousands of these at one refinery every worker was wearing one but in 2014 a uh, refinery out in california had an explosion all the workers were wearing was h2s monitors because that was their primary uh, uh, atmospheric threat and they upgraded to the BW Clip 4s. Because of that, we came up with a much more economical uh, uh, option for that industry, which is the BW Icon and Icon Flex. Um, so, and then you have, which was in 2014, the largest multi-gas, the largest selling multi-gas monitor in the entire world, the BW Microclip, and it's, uh, uh, Big Brother, if you will, the Microclip X3, big difference here is, you know, they operate the same, they work the same, same features, same benefits. The warranty is different because we use a different oxygen sensor. And uh, the XL is a two-year warranty bumper to bumper, and the X3 is a three-year warranty with an expected life of the oxygen sensor of five years. So a bit of a game changer there. Uh, also, since it has no lead or lead byproducts in it, uh, it's very uh, recyclable friendly. Uh, Icon and Icon Flex released this year as well, end of last year. Um, that's been a real game changer because this is a four gas monitor, uh, very lightweight, very economical. And um, you can see in one case, it's just the Icon driven and the other one has a direct reading. And this is a monitor that you can have a two year finite life. It's basically about half the cost of what this BW Clip 4 was. So when we're looking at upgrading this market, which they're looking at right now, we have a much more affordable option for that. The BW Solo is our uh, signature uh, single gas monitor. It's replaced the Gas Alert Extreme. It's got Bluetooth. I should have said that both the BW Ultra and Icon Flex have Bluetooth. So all of these monitors um, are easily uh, 
uh, tethered to an iPhone or coming down uh, the road shortly, another device that we can tether it to and uh, it can report back and we can actually see a world away on a computer screen, virtual real-time readings of what any worker is being exposed to with our safety suite real-time software. Uh, of course, the docking stations, the microdock is still in play, but the IntelliDocs that came out in 014 is the real workhorse nowadays for the BW line, but the microdocs are still out there and still working like they did when they came out a decade or so ago. Of course, we have confined space kits. When you're going out to work, you can have everything in its place and a place for everything. So you've got even some of the IR connectivity kit for computer interface, uh, the 10 to up to 75 foot of hose for this device, the Max XT2, probes, gas cylinder regulator to do bump testing and calibration in the field, so um, and calibration hose. So uh, very popular uh, to have these attache kits. Of course, we had one worker. We're going to talk about things that can poison the LEL sensor or poison sensors in general. And we had one customer that bought dozens of these. And they liked them so much, they had a nice shiny attache kit. They uh, shined them up with armor all. And they called us up and they said, your monitors, all of them are failing the LEL bump test. You know, why did you do this to us? And, and they kind of, in the course of talking to us, said, yeah, and we, we were so happy when we got these. We shined them all up. And we, well, what'd you use? Armor all. What's in there? Silicone. That's the kryptonite in an LEL catalytic bead sensor. So and it's actually the reason why we bump test prior to each day's use is it has that characteristic of good today, bad tomorrow, if I exposed it to the wrong substances. So just keep that in mind, kind of some do's and don'ts, cautions and warnings when you're using gas detection. Here's the thing, when um, we came up with a simple little cheat sheet for our sellers and for our channel partners, even for end users, as far as what they should be considering if they're not asked the questions by somebody when they're looking to upgrade or replace their current uh, uh, gas detection equipment. And it is a 90% replacement market. There's not a lot of people that are buying a gas monitor for the very first time. So these are educated end users when you're selling it to them. Most of the time they know exactly what they want and they know what they don't want. So you just have to ask, you know, um, in this particular case, if I had asked, I could have saved a a, a, a trip all the way up to Washington, D.C. to talk to at and if, if they said, you know, hey, we want our money back on all this equipment. They're going in and out of alarm. We can't do our work. And if I just said, well, what'd you use before? And they said, you know, O2 LEL meters, I would have said, probably the CO is just doing its job, right? So, you know, are you using single gas or multi-gas? In that case, it was just two gas. What are the gases? O2 and LEL in that case. Pumped or diffusion? Uh, do you have attendance and entrance? Uh, do you need to take your remote sampling prior to entry? In many cases, that's absolute. Um, docking stations or manual calibration and bump testing. What are some of the features and benefits that are important to you in a gas monitor, such as ease of use, ruggedness, reliability, cost of ownership? And nowadays, people are asking for at least the option of wireless capability. If they're not tethering it now, they'll tether it later. Um, and it's really what we talk about as far as connected worker. And in five years from now, in my opinion, everybody will have wireless gas monitors and will be monitored by uh, somebody uh, behind a computer screen to make sure that they're safe in real time. Um, in your biggest challenges, what are they in when it comes to atmospheric monitoring? Worker compliance, that same software will be able to tell in real time whether that unit was bump tested or calibrated within its interval by show, showing simple pawn of that worker wherever they are in a red, yellow, and green status. Uh, you got to worry about these environmental conditions. Uh, we have very high IP ratings on our monitors for intrinsic, uh, I'm sorry, for ingress protection of dirt, dust, and water. And we test them for these, and we have some of the highest ratings out there, IP68 rating, which was for water submersion at, at extended intervals, and um, even high pressure water spray, which can spread the seal if it's caught on the edge of the gas monitor like a fireman's hose. So, you know, we're very aware that these are used in some of the worst atmospheres that an unprotected worker can 
can be exposed to and the monitor has to meet those conditions. So IP68 rating is pretty much the standard that we go for nowadays with our monitors. What kind of instrument management system do you use? Is it automated or is it manual? Um, so based on that, there was a, a customer that I had that, uh, you know, when you get to number five, how important is proper record keeping? You know, uh, they had a death in a confined space and they uh, were looking for monitors and it had to have a docking station because documentation beats confrontation and they were being confronted with, you know, proper care and maintenance of their product. And they really couldn't account for it other than a sticker that was barely legible after they put it on used in these locations where they were working. Further to the instrument management systems, uh, this goes back to the year I was born, but even, you know, in 1958, this was a manual instrument management system. This gentleman was maintaining a place for everything, everything in its place, everyone had a number, and he made sure that they were in good working order for the workers. Bump test and record keeping system removes human subjectivity. The IntelliDocs gives you verifiable, traceable, complete records for compliance of bump tests, even calibration. Our safety suite device configurator software will be able to read all this information, including the data logs and event logs from the monitor and bump test and record. We work with international, actually on the board with International Safety Equipment Association, and this we developed as these definitions of a bump test, calibration check, and full span calibration among competitors. MSA, Drager, 3M, Scott, Biosystems came up with these definitions back in 2010. OSHA adopted them in what they call a SHIB, Safety and Health Information Bulletin, in 2013. We worked with them for three years to update their safety and health information bulletin. If you Google SHIB 0930-2013, you will find this OSHA SHIB and it's, it will reference this document right here with the definitions. Safety Suite Device Configurator, this is our software. Basically gives you no charge freeware on-premise, means it's, it's loaded onto your commute, computer. Uh, the software and giving you high value and speaks both languages of Honeywell's main two product, uh, um, uh, portable products, I should say, BW and Ray systems. So it's bilingual when that, as far as that's concerned. Um, benefits is minimized device management, uh, overhead simplifies user interaction, combined portable product offerings, like I said, and address data and privacy and security concerns. These are the uh, units that can be connected either by ethernet, uh, USB cable, uh, Bluetooth, IR dongle, and, uh, and so on. You can see for all the products here. Poisoning, talked about that. Silicones, kryptonite. We do, do use in the BW portfolio enhanced silicone uh, uh, poison resistant sensors, but they're not gonna be very good for alcohols and ketones and heavier hydrocarbons. So we have you give you an option to do the unfiltered one. It's just going to not last as long and you may find out you're replacing it even though it's only a warranty period because of the fact that it got poisoned in the field. Uh, we will not uh, give it to you free of charge. So you have to, you know, there's a trade-off. You want added protection, it's going to be limited in its scope of broad range capability. Just make sure that the sensor matches the application. And as far as cleaning them, we have recommendations based on all of these substances that can affect your sensors uh, from bug repellents to, you know, to, to cleaners and lubricants. This document came out during COVID. Obviously, it was a concern. How do we, how do we clean our monitors? Um, and we came out with the do's and don'ts. Even if you think using a citrus cleaner has a very you know, fresh smell and it, it's very uh, friendly with the environment, it's not friendly with the electrochemical sensors. Uh, so this is a, a big problem. So you want to make sure you don't poison the monitor that's meant to, to protect you in a, um, a hazardous atmosphere. And uh, that completes the presentation for day. today. I'm going to kick it back over to Sean uh, for our Q&A session. Well, uh, thanks, Andrew. That was great. Um, 
For the question and answer, it's time for all of us to take advantage of having an expert like Andrew with us to answer any and all questions you may have. So to send in any questions, just please use the chat feature. And please note that if you have any product specific questions such as pricing, availability, we encourage you to visit our website, globaltestsupply.com. There you will find a list of our products, pricing, availability, tech specs, as well as our contact information and the different ways you can connect with us. Our technical support staff will be happy to address and answer any and all questions you may have. Should it be after this question period? And uh, so far, we do we haven't gotten a question. So we got a uh, clean board. Yeah, clean board. But I have a few that I uh, get quite a bit. So uh, Andrew, this this is a good one. Is the docking stations affected by where they are located, such as inside an office or inside a shop? It can be if it's not considered to be a fresh air environment because it's going to have cylinders of calibration gas connected to it so it can calibrate, but it's going to zero and calibrate the oxygen in a fresh air environment. So you're going to have the first uh, uh, inlet is usually we just put a little uh, particulate filter on there so it doesn't suck in dirt and dust. But it should be, uh, you know, that slide where we showed you breath of fresh air, 20.9% oxygen and 0% uh, uh, LEL gases, uh, CO, H2S, any of the toxic gases you're trying to calibrate. In some cases, we've had to put them in environments where they, they wanted them there, but couldn't ensure that it was a cleaner environment like a steel mill or pulp and paper mill. And we had to attach a hospital grade cylinder of air to that inlet. Uh, and they had to replace it as it was uh, as it got empty. So yeah, it does matter where you put your docking station. Okay, great. And uh, we have a question here. Can the sensors be installed by the end user if we want to switch the type of gas sensor? So in some of our uh, gas monitors, yes. And uh, what you're going to find in, in very shortly when we release it, I'm going to give you a preview of coming attractions is the biggest difference, you know, the biggest change in sensors would be, and what, what you're really referring to is what we call smart sensors, plug and play sensors, and they're field replaceable. Um, in the BW Flex, we're coming out this year with a Flex Eye with intelligent sensors that are not only gonna have that capability on a very uh, uh, low cost monitor, um, with the higher cost monitors, obviously we have it with the Ray product, uh, even the BW Ultra has, you know, one channel where it would recognize it and be a smart sensor. But moving forward, digital sensors will have know their own name, serial number, will have pre-calibrated sets in them. So even if you're on a ship out to sea and you need to change that sensor, they don't like having cylinders of gas. So sometimes when they go come into port, they're looking for a service center, you know, to uh, uh, turn around their, their equipment and calibrate them. In this particular case, they're just going to unplug and plug in, and they'll have pre-calibrated sensors. It will always ha also have predictive calibration. So it'll tell you, hey, your environment's really bad. Even though you thought you were good for 30, 60, 180 days, you should probably calibrate the sensor. Or it's not as bad as you thought. And even though pre-calibration is due, we see it pretty stable right now, and you could give it another 30 days. So that's coming very, very soon across the board. Well, that's really cool to hear that. Uh, that sounds like a nice future for this it's kind a of jump in technology. That's a game changer. Great. Um, Good question. We actually, Kenneth just asked, do I need to use one of these while I clean the inside of a hospital boiler? I am worried about natural gas and oxygen levels. Also, will soot affect the performance of the instrument? Soot? Like soot inside? Yeah. yeah. So the answer is yes and yes. Uh, but that's why, remember, I told you that we use IP ratings for dirt, dust, and water. So, you know, it might um, affect the filter, and you might have to replace the filter. But if I, you know, the, the, the microclip and uh, the, um, the icon have an external, I call it a COVID mask, but it's an external filter that you can even dock the monitor with it on in the, in the icon. And you'll have to remove it and, and it's an external filter and really these dirty nasty environments so that's going to be a, a, a really convenient to have and require easier maintenance but still maintenance um, and then the pumped units have a, a water filter a hydrophobic filter 
which means it won't allow watering, but it's an excellent dust and particulate filter too. It's just gonna be a case where you're gonna replace them more frequently. You might even have to replace them during that day. So have a few uh, handy. And again, that's why we do bump testing is we wanna make sure the sensors are okay, but the entire respiratory system of the monitor is okay. I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, Kenneth, if there's anything else you need to ask, feel free to send it to the chat. Um, another question that we get pretty often is if I only need use the detector a couple times a year and I don't always have access to bump test gas, do I, how often should I be doing bump tests? Is it absolutely necessary along those lines? My answer is usually, uh, are you interested in what OSHA has to say about it? And that then will reference the Safety and Health Information Bulletin 0930-2013. It's SHIB. And if you Google that, you will get a better answer from them as to their standpoint. Now, they go out of their way to say this is not a new regulation or standard, but it's just a good, it, it, it's information for companies to provide a, a better workplace environment for their workers. So it's a best practice. Um, and then they say, uh, you know, follow the re manufacturer's recommendations at a minimum. Well, guess what we all say prior to each day's use. So you're kind of stuck. And, and, uh, all, and that's, you know, that's the nature of the business. Let's take the previous question and, uh, you know, say, well, I only use it a couple of times in these hospital boilers throughout the year. Well, now I've got a whole other dynamic that I'm dealing with that could be just, just one use could completely contaminate that. A filter where the sensors need to breathe. Good question. Yeah, it comes up. Helpful. It yeah. comes up very often, and 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 uh, I don't have much wiggle room for it. Yeah, no, I don't blame you. I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's a safety product, and uh, you got to follow what the safety product requirements are. Um, well, it looks you don't have to get a docking station. You can just get a cylinder of gas, a regulator, and apply the gas. Yeah, and, and you can get uh, hundreds of bump tests out of that one cylinder of gas, and that cylinder of gas will last you for two years. Yeah, good point. Exactly. You don't need the full setup. Um, I believe that's all the questions for today. We are starting to get to the near the end of our webinar. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact us directly on globaltestsupply.com. You'll find all our information there. On behalf of Global Test Supply University, we thank you for attending our webinar today. We hope that you found it informative and helpful. And we're available to assist you in any way. Simply visit us at globaltestsupply.com for anything you need, including our contact info. At the end of the webinar, we will have a very short, short survey that we would like you to complete. Your feedback will assist us in improving and allow us to bring you more topics that are of interest to you. We have upcoming webinars for the next few weeks and months. Please visit us, visit our training section on globaltestfly.com for a full schedule of the upcoming webinars and topics. Don't forget that as a thank you for attending our webinar today, your name will be entered into the draw to win $100 off your next online order. The winner will be announced on our social media ch channels, so please be sure to check us out there. And lastly, just huge thank you, Andrew, for all your help. This was very informative for, for everyone, and uh, it was great listening to you to hear that firsthand experience. Uh, our pleasure and thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you.